I can tell you now I'm in the most beautiful Cassis in the south of France, very lucky. And our very kind guest to join us today, Connor McCarthy, is joining us from Dublin. What's it like in Dublin today, Connor? It's not bad. The, the September chill is starting to come in, but it's bright. It's not raining. Not that's raining. That's always that's always a plus as long as it's not raining. Well, it's really super to see so many of you taking the time to join us today. And as I say, I'm so delighted to yeah. be chatting with Connor. And actually, I haven't I'll admit I haven't known Connor very long. We only met for the first time a few weeks ago. But straight away, uh, we kind of clicked on our chat and I thought there'd be so much useful information that Connor could share with all of you. So, Connor, you're very welcome here today on our 42 Courses Q&A, which we're called uh, Less Drudge AI. Is, is AI drudge, Connor? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's anything but. And, and first of all, thank you so, so much for, for having me on here. It's a real privilege to speak to everyone. And thank you, everyone, for, for showing up. Uh, it's not drudge, but I, I do think it can remove the drudge and really get to the core of things that we do best. You know, we can make something that is an expression of our best talents and abilities. And an uh, AI consultant, a very 2024 job title. Maybe just to tell everybody who's joined us what your background is and how you determine yourself as being an AI consultant in these modern days. Yes. So going way back, I was a software engineer. Um, so I have never lost that kind of uh, techie, nerdy mindset about everything, really. Um, and through the years, I, I kind of transitioned from from being at, at the code face uh, more into kind of doing tech consultancy. So that was the, the beginning of my consultancy career, if you like. Uh, through a lucky set of circumstances, I ended up working with Seth Godin um, on his all-team MBA leadership program. Uh, and they asked me to coach that then, and I coached that for seven or eight years. So I, alongside my consultancy, I became a coach. And that was a very interesting um, experience, which I think ties into my approach to my AI consultancy. And that's why I mention it. Just working with leaders, working with people who are in organizations, trying to get things done and trying to survive the workplace. Uh, it was very eye opening to me who, who, you know, coming from tech to see this other more kind of human side of things. So I kind of started to roll that into my consultancy more um, because I was seeing it up, up close and personal. Um, and then, of course, once AI came along, um, there was no way that my job was not going to be affected by AI in the same way that I doubt anyone's job won't be affected by AI in the coming years. So it kind of made sense to me to say, OK, if AI is going to have this outsized effect on, on all parts of our work life, on how we learn, on how we interact, then being an AI consultant might be the best way to kind of help people through all the, the various issues uh, that AI is already throwing up. So here I am today. And of course, with something like this, in a way, we all join at the same stage. You know, we, we're all having to learn this from a new, but you're very much in favour of constant learning. Obviously, something we're very in favour of in Portugal Courses, but uh, when we first got chatting, uh, mm. I noticed we'd both done the MindWorks course back at sort of almost at the start of sort of the lockdown period when people went bonkers were just like, <laughs> you know, I've got this time to myself and use the opportunity to learn more if I can. So you really see the value in this constant uh, sort of upskilling or whatever we want to call it, Connor. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. Like when COVID happened and people suddenly were stuck at home and had more time, it's interesting that so many people went to upskilling instead of maybe, you know, Netflix skilling or whatever you call that. Um, so there is, I think there's there's a hunger in everyone to to know more, to want to better themselves. Like you can call it part of the personal development work that that um, that people are interested in, but always always tipping away at understanding more about um, your job, about the the people you work with, about the company you work in, about the industry. There's so many ways that a little bit more knowledge can be a lever to help you get to. Maybe it's to get to a better promotion or maybe to help do your work better. But I, I really think that, um, that, and this is why I love 42 Courses so much, that kind of bite-size, kind of actionable learning with the kind of behavioral mechanics built in to, to make that learning experience really effective. I think it's a really powerful thing these days. 
and uh, upskilling learning whatever you want to call it um it has become so much more accessible in so many ways even if it's just straightforward watching youtube videos or, you know it's so accessible now it's not closed off and only through academic institutions there's so many ways in which we can upskill and learn more mm, absolutely yeah it's it's um i mean your 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 favorite thought leader probably has they at least have a book or two that you can learn something from and books by the way are still the most reliable way to learn anything when when you think of the the value for money in a book that costs you you know 10 pounds whatever and you get this the distilled wisdom of one person who has spent years on this topic boiled down for you uh like you know easily easy easy to understand uh implementing it of course is another thing but books are are, are always there then there's courses i even meet a lot of people now who you know they say they go down rabbit holes, but I think that's maybe kind of code word for I found myself so interested in this thing that I watched all the YouTube videos. I listened to the podcast. I even bought the book. I subscribed to the newsletter. It's like the the information is free, essentially. Uh, what's missing is that that will to learn. Um, and again, I think I think more people have it than not. It's just uh, making that information accessible. Absolutely. I mean, they say that curiosity is one of the sort of eminent it's not really a skill it is something within you but to have that curiosity is just so key to mm. then want to explore as you say people use the word going down rabbit holes but really the joy of learning is that you can follow down sort of in any route mm. and uh, you very much now have pursued what must have been quite a fast track learning then opportunity for yourself in terms of saying okay look obviously I have the IT background I have the learning background and now's the time to really get clued up on what can AI offer us and how do I keep up with the rapid changing in this environment yeah absolutely so you know these days the word career is becoming looser and looser in the modern uh, sense of the word. Like my parents, they had careers. My dad was in the bank all his life, like started on day one, retired in the bank. And I, that's largely not the case anymore. Personally speaking, I think you can say, Louise, like I've had a portfolio career, I've had lots of uh, different jobs, different types of jobs in different situations. And five years ago, I wouldn't have guessed that I would be sitting here doing this. Um, so I think, again, that kind of upskilling and constant upskilling prepares people for, well, this world that we live in now with AI. So in my situation, you know, I, I did have that uh, techie background, let's say. So so I, I was always kind of interested in what AI was doing. But of course, the release of ChatGPT in November 2022 suddenly made this incredibly powerful um, technology available to everyone through the browser. And so the first thing was I just started writing code and building things because I was hearing hints that it was pretty good at writing code. And I said, well, let's see. Um, so I put my my uh, engineer hat back on and it was pretty incredible. It, it did for the first time in a long time. I was like, oh, this seems like magic from somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's like the first time you use a, a touchscreen smartphone. Uh, which if anyone can remember that, that going from a Nokia push button to like, oh my God, you just touched the screen. It's like magic. So getting my hands dirty with code was the first thing. And then there was, a, there was a really interesting use case. And I remember it so distinctly. There was a guy probably in late November, 2022, he was a consultant and he was mentoring. Um, I think it was a guy who was maybe in his late teenage years. and. This guy, he was uh, he was mowing lawns in the local neighborhood, and that was that was a kind of a summer gig for him. But this guy, the, this teenager, didn't have amazing communication skills. Like he he wasn't really able to sell himself or to describe well what he did or you know the outcome that he would give by mowing lawns. And so this mentor said, Do "You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna see if there's if this AI, this new ChatGPT thing, can help." And he 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 published the, this kind of series of of experiments that he did with this teenager, and it went from, you know, the teenager would write this ostensible sales email to potential customers, uh, then they would pop that into ChatGPT and say, you know, can you make this into more of an interesting and persuasive uh, sales email? And it did, and then he was able to copy and paste that back 
and send it out to his customers and and help grow his business that way. And it was the first time now that's that's rife. But it was the first time I kind of went, wow, that's someone who was using this technology in a very real way to grow his business and 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 do it in a kind of in a way that he could see all the steps, see how it was working. So that was the kind of again, that was the more kind of human side of things where I went, wow, this this is such an enabler. Suddenly, suddenly um the 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 standard has been has been raised. And a lot of people say, you know, it lowers the bar, which it does. It lowers the bar to entry. AI can lower the bar to entry for a lot of different disciplines. But I think it always raises the standard as well, because it, now it means that for things to be really good, they have to be really, really good, if that makes sense. That's a great example that you gave, because something really so simple. So I think that's yeah. something that everybody can immediately relate to. And uh, I like the way that you've told that, because we can overcomplicate things. And that then makes you fearful to take the first step. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of people join this call. Thanks, everybody who's joined. And uh, I'd love to hear some of either the maybe the fears you have or the problems you've had using AI yourself or ways in which you've maybe totally embraced it and it's it's changed your ways. But what I'll say to you first, kind of whilst we're waiting to hear comments from people, is... Uh, uh, working as an AI consultant today in 2024, what's the sort of typical uh, contact you get from somebody? What's a very common problem that they come to you with? Um, there's usually three buckets of things. The first is, let's call it training. Like, I know this thing is out there. It seems to be giving incredible results or <laughs> my competitors are doing it. How do I do it? How do I train myself? How do I get to understand it, how to train my team, like what's the most basic step I can take just to get my head around this. The second one would be, you know, I, I know what it does. I know what it's capable of, but how do I actually use it? How do I uh, integrate it into my business? You know, how do I, how do I use it strategically? And then the last one is nuts and bolts, build something. Like I need a tool that does X, Y, Z, and I think AI can do it faster and cheaper than, than the alternatives. So they're usually the three buckets of, of work that, that I see. Okay, and that's very interesting. We'll just talk a little bit maybe about that first one then. You're saying about, you know, whatever, say I'm here, I'm in my firm, I've got a small team of 10 people and everyone's at different stages. Somebody's maybe really into AI, keeps banging on about it. Somebody else is saying, oh, I don't think we should use it. Um, I think I said to you when I first started, uh, when I first met you, I wasn't really sure myself uh, of the value that you could get from an AI course, because I felt like you needed to just dive straight in and get practicing it yourself. Uh, I mean, I feel a little bit differently about that now, but maybe you'd like to talk a little bit more about that whole concept of uh, learning more about the value of AI through through a training event. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this goes back to the kind of upskilling thing. So, um, I did a master's years ago in helping children to learn music through software. And I, all my research was based on this idea called um, constructionism. And constructionism is the idea that we learn by making things. So when it comes to learning, I often, I always keep an eye out and I always do this in my own training. Like, what am I building that's going to help me understand this thing better? Now, Building doesn't have to be an app or something. It can literally be building a blog post. It can be building a very simple website. It can be building a set of operating principles for my business. Um, but I think when people are able to create something using AI, just kind of light touch, you know, um, using the tools and being able to prompt it and, and, and make it work for you, I think that's often the tipping point where they're able to kind of go, oh, this, 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 is an, this can extend and enhance the work that I do. Because I've always said that AI, it kind of, it can help you do three things. It can bring fresh eyes mm -hmm. to the work that you do. It can remove that kind of fear of the blank page. The, and that doesn't have to be just text. It can be code or, or whatever you like. And then it takes away busy work. It can just get rid of a lot of the kind of drudge work. And with most technologies and most products, it's only when, you know, the first time you press that Uber button to order a taxi, you kind of go, oh, oh, wow, that's actually, it works. <laughs> it's as simple as that, and, and I immediately get the benefits. That That's the tipping point for a lot of people who are often fearful. 
And another thing that you said to me that I found interesting when we were first chatting, Connor, was you said that you'd had a client come to you and then you'd worked with them using AI. And I don't know if it was to create their strategy or if they already had a strategy and they were looking to update it. But that interested me as well. I think most people think of AI as, like you say, you, it might be you're building an AI bot for your site to help, as a, or it may be that you're just using it to uh, fine tune some piece of writing that you're doing. But going back to these uh, very, very core business requirements that we need to set down, it's like either I haven't realized I haven't got a strategy, <laughs> or else it's like, now look, we haven't assessed the strategy for five years. The world has changed. We need to. Where does AI come in terms of those very, very core business skills, uh, business foundations that we need to have? Mm, it's, it's, it's a great point. And I am, I'm such a fan of strategy while also recognizing that strategy can get totally out of hand. And suddenly every plan is a strategy and, and they can be 50 pages long and suddenly no one reads them. So I think, I think the real value of AI in doing strategy work is as that thinking partner. So quite a famous uh, strategist is a guy called Roger Martin. Um, and he, he has quite a number of books and he's one called Playing to Win. And I think the I bring that up because the the that was the project I was working on um, previously on strategy. And I said, you know what, I'm going to I'm just going to use the Roger Martin framework um, on this project. And it was like having Roger Martin in my pocket to ask questions of. You know, you can digest a book and you can you can use it and that's great. But when you're actually able to engage with something that, and I hesitate to use the word, something that thinks like Roger Martin, suddenly you're in a dialogue and suddenly it's much more enjoyable. It's less like homework and it's more like, oh, we're just we're just having a chat. So so you can, you know. And we don't have to get deep into this, but obviously you can uh, like I created a, a custom GPT that was the Roger Martin framework GPT. And it just it didn't, you know, I'm very wary of like, give me the answer because that usually doesn't work. And AI still has a lot of work to do um, in terms of kind of taste and nuance. Um, but it was really great to help me, um, I guess, kind of sharpen my thinking around what this client wanted out of a strategic process. So, and I was very clear with the client. I said, look, I'm going to be using this. I'll show you how to use it, which he enjoyed as well. Um, and over time, we just worked on the strategy and we were able to kind of boil it down. And it was, at the end of it, I was able to look back and go, this is definitely a Roger Martin-esque strategy. And I don't know if I would have gotten there just by reading the book and and applying the book alone. Very, very interesting. So I'm going to bring in Philip's question here. Now, Philip, thank you very much for joining the call, Philip Story. And Philip has asked how you could create a GPT for an agency for their own marketing. What would be your first uh, approach in terms of responding to that type of query from a from a client there now, Connie? Absolutely. So um, th I think <laughs> this might sound counterintuitive, but Often with AI, it's handy to pull out a sheet of paper and write down exactly what you're thinking of. Like what, you know, for an agency for your own marketing, who are your customers? What, what is the goal of having a marketing GPT? Is the goal to um, create fresh content? Is the goal to create a marketing strategy? Is, it, is, it, is the goal to produce audience insights and research? So always kind of pausing and going, what's, what's the goal here? Because... GPTs and AI in general work, they work, they work on the basis of this principle. If you don't give them any instructions, their, their most basic um, kind of hidden instruction is you are a helpful assistant. Okay, that's, that's what it's told to be unless you tell them otherwise. So it's helpful to a fault. Uh, it would prefer to lie to you as long as it thinks it's being helpful, if that makes sense. <laughs> it cares so much about just being helpful, which is so broad. It's kind of broad enough to be useless. But if you can tell a GPT, here's what I want to do. You know, I, I, I want I need to create a customized um, content plan for six months for my marketing agency and give it as much detail as you can. What you do is you, you help shape a GPT's thinking effectively. Um, 
the tool the tool I usually go to first they're called custom GPTs. Um, if anyone hasn't used them before, they're a feature of paid chat GPT. So you can go in and create your own little bot that is specifically for like in this case, this could be the marketing agency GPT. Um, and you can load it up with PDFs. You can describe the outcomes you want. You can describe your role. You can say, you know, I'm a, I'm the head of marketing or marketing assistant, whatever it is. Um, you can tell it the kind of style and tone. You can say, you know, be, be formal. Don't use these words. Or, you know, our audience prefers this type of thing. You know, you can tell it the format of what you want back. You know, I'd like a table or I'd like a PDF. So it, it all goes in there, but, it, but it's, it's, it's absolutely not a replacement for understanding your audience for knowing what good looks like because the first thing that an ai will give you back it'll be confidently like this is it this is your answer we always have to push back and kind of go is is this really what i want and there will be bits that are great and there'll be bits that are weak and that's why you're always in a dialogue so i think that's very interesting that you said uh there to sit down at the start and you know as it were get to get back to the pen and paper because um, I think that is key, isn't it, Connor, that we need to be very sure uh, what we're working on. We must be very specific. Um, and uh, at the very start of ChatGPT, when it very first sort of became popular, that was really the main thing we saw was people helping us learn prompts. Uh, learning trend, it'd be list and this list of prompts, but it really is key, isn't it, to working effectively is the more information that you give it on your particular aim, that the mm. more fine tuned it's going to be. Because as you say, it's not, uh, AI is not uh, uh, backward in, I mean, I've been in situations myself preparing documents and just asking, so, oh, and can you give me a couple of podcasts that would be relevant in this area? And the ones it recommended basically didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there so you go. Thank, yeah. thank the Lord, I am the type of person that, you know, before I, you know, use information that I, I yeah. always double check. But this concept of chat GPT wanting basically to please like a little puppy, it, it will happily make stuff up. And then when you say, oh, is, oh you needed something to be true. I've, I've come across this response several times. So let's just maybe spend a little bit of time on you know how how i would go about uh you know doing this this fine tuning you know training it maybe in my style of writing or uh mm. training it in like you were saying the roger martin way of thinking can mm -hmm. you give a little a few more sort of bits of advice about that so, so that's a really good example like my style of writing so um so in, in your custom GPT, I'll talk about that first. You can you can give it a sample of writing. You can say, here's a blog post I wrote. Uh, tell me, what's my style of writing? Because most people, I found that surprising when I did that for myself. I said, how do, how do I write? And it gave me back this quite accurate um, kind of description of this is this is the type of thing you write. And if if you like that, then you can feed that into the custom GPT and say, you know, my writing is like this, so whatever your output is, kind of make sure it's it kind of matches up with that. There's also a thing in uh, ChatGPT called custom instructions, and that's that's across the whole of ChatGPT. Uh, so it, it'll apply to every custom GPT you make, and that's where you can give it kind of broad instructions. You know, let's say you want only formal writing. Um, I, I, no matter what it puts out, make the writing formal. You can tell it your job and your the goals in your job um you know you can just kind of give it very broad instructions that it's to apply to anything it creates but i think i think when it comes to actually um actually giving it instructions the idea of it being a helpful but distracted assistant can help um i'm always anthropomorphizing this because uh because i find it it helps me kind of go Okay, I'm definitely collaborating with AI and we're always collaborating and it's not perfect and I'm not perfect, but together we have a chance to produce something great. So if I know that it's distracted and it will lie to me in favor of being helpful, how do I bake that in to what I'm telling it? Like, how do I make sure that I'm putting the right boundaries on things, that I'm reminding it to uh, that this is the goal? Um, you can even ask it in a conversation. You can say, tell me again, what's the goal we're going for here? Because sometimes 
<laughs> it drifts off. It's looking out the window and, and it's lost its train of thought. There's even I've this is a funny one. I've gotten different results from telling a GPT they're telling in a conversation saying, do a great job. It will actually do a better job. It's it, yeah, it's almost like that thing of in school. Remember, it's like now try as hard as you can. Um, uh, so little tweaks like that always always bring it back to am I being as clear as I can be? So, you know, there's there's maybe this false notion that AI is just it's amazing and it's the solution to everything. But when you start using it and you hit speed bumps like fake podcasts, you kind of go, no, you get out what you put in, um, as with so much in life. So, yeah, really having that conversation, um, taking the time to like helping it to help you, essentially. Okay, so we've talked about getting effective results by giving the tool a lot of information, but you also then mentioned boundaries. And I wonder what you uh, advise people about then the area of security. I want to feed ChatGPT with lots of information so that it knows who I am, what my aims are, maybe, you know, what, what line of business in, what I'm, what I'm trying to get to. At the same time, it's a fine line. I, I have to be careful. I might be feeding up all my blog posts, but heck, I don't want to download confidential information. Yeah. So how do we go about this and maybe ensuring that our staff aren't giving away key intellectual secrets? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And this is, oh, look, this is such a hot topic because um, is is this AI platform using my data or not? Does it already have it and the, the horse has bolted? Mm. Maybe. Um, and there's so many ways to think about this. Like, for example, there's been a lot of talk in the news recently about, you know, um, about you can set up your website and and put something in, in in a file there that says like don't crawl this website if you're an AI, basically if you're a large language if you're looking for training data for your large language model. But the reality is if you go onto the the archive.org onto the web archive, even if you created that file today, yesterday's version of your site is on the web archive. And that's you you don't have that file there. So it's kind of like that's free and open for the for the, the LLM to, to suck in that data. There are um, like G, or ChatGPT has an explicit button to say, don't use this, don't use these conversations in your training data. Um, perplexity also, which is a, a, a phenomenal um, uh, tool to use that I can recommend. Uh, that also has a don't use this tool in the data. I think ChatGPT, you have to turn that off explicitly. And I think Perplexly, you have to turn that off explicitly as well. Now, there's also, you know, these AIs aren't, uh, they aren't like search engines. So if you did upload something that was confidential, the chances of it coming back exactly the same are very, very slim. I think that used to happen, but then they tweaked it and then they changed things because the the way that LLMs um, kind of create their output is is not like a search function like Google. Um, it's more to do with meaning. So you might never get back the exact um, text that you wrote, say. Um, but I think if at all possible, that the the business um, the business versions of these tools often have better controls because these platforms know they want businesses to sign up, but businesses are very uh, nervous about well, what's going into your training models. So they would have more uh, tight tight controls on on what gets used and what doesn't. Okay, and the other thing that uh, interests me, and I'm sure lots of people on the call have been involved in uh, thinking about using or using ChatGPT in terms of uh, CVs, uh, uh, job applications. We've known for years that the job uh, agencies have been using crawlers to filter us out, as it were. Uh, and now they're sort of on the other side of the fence and they're complaining that everybody's submitting CVs that are very obviously written by chat GP to GPT. So I suppose uh, I suppose my main question would be, obviously, I'm very much in favor of using GPT as a tool if I were to be producing a document, for example, a CV. But 
how how do we go about this? Do you advise is CVs or any sort of documents like this where it's bringing our own voice to the table versus being patently obvious that we've just churned something out like a 16 year old does for their homework yes. <laughs> and gets caught by the teacher <laughs> it's your, your friend's homework and then put your name on it um this is really interesting and i have i have a response that might seem out of left field but um i throughout my years of of coaching i sometimes did career coaching and sometimes that career coaching involved upgrading resumes and CVs and that kind of thing. And the the thing you quickly realize is that the when you're in the game of of really trying to write a resume to match a job posting, you're you're playing in a game that has hundreds if not thousands of other people all trying to do the same thing. Um there's a there's a there's a bit of anecdata out there that says that 95% of all jobs never get posted that they're filled internally it's it's the boss saying to their lead programmer do you know anyone who's good at, at coding because you know we need someone yesterday or it's you know i have a friend who does marketing over here he's looking for a job yeah bring him. you know it's that kind of stuff that's the stuff that hits the uh the recruitment websites let's say it's not it's maybe not the highest quality stuff because then you're in a, a kind of a farm of resumes and cvs so i <laughs> i used to say to people that's very depressing kind of no, no, no. But here's here's the thing. I think there's a plus in all this. So, what what an employer is looking for is, you know, can you do the job? Can you get a result? Is the output of whatever time you're spending on this, um, does it meet spec or better? Does it exceed spec? So instead of resumes, I would always say to people, can you create something for a specific company that you would love to work with, not just Acme Corp. Like pick a business that you'd be like, I, I really want to work in Intercom and I really want to work in their marketing department. Instead of sending them a, a resume or CV, make something. Write them a, like write them 10,000 words on some idea that you heard them mention in a podcast. Create a one page uh, landing page for some feature that they're thinking of building, but will never get around to. You know, if you're good at coding, maybe create a little chatbot or something that does some like there are so many ways that you can catch people's attention that isn't through the through you, that that means you're not getting in the same kind of competitive race with everyone else so uh there was an idea years ago called uh, be a permissionless apprentice like n don't ask permission just go do it and pretend you already work there and you're trying to do a really great job and i i just throw that out there as just a different way to think about things and you're right i, I was a bit harsh on resumes and cvs they they, they do have their place but if at all possible like make something, show people that you have the skill and the talent and just the, I suppose, a little dose of entrepreneurship to go and, and do the thing. Yeah, that's very interesting because it sort of feeds into the fear, I think, that people have maybe about using AI for writing, for example, that it does make everything so so generic everything becomes so similar um and it, to think left of center i mean we often are chatting in 42 courses saying how difficult it is to get in front of people and it's like well should we just write a letter you know you're trying to think of anything old school that will really so rarely do you get a letter but then there's nowhere to send it to now because people <laughs> don't basically <laughs> not so many in central offices anyway that's sort of a by the by um, but that's very interesting. And so think left of center. Now, what I'd like to know now, maybe uh, we're getting sort of close to wrapping up time. So if I'm on this call and I, I, I don't suspect there's that many people who haven't embraced AI in some shape or form, but we were talking about the prompts. Mm -hmm. uh, if I haven't really used ChatGPT at all, uh, are there other tools apart from just ChatGPT? And I'm thinking now, I saw early on in the chat, one of our uh, 
people joining us today, uh, Sneha Susan had used the AI note taker, for example. So if Susan's uh, got permission from me here for the AI assistant who's taking notes for the meeting. Now, there's loads of super tools out there that you can upload maybe to, uh, you can upload one to YouTube so that it does a summary for you, five main points. But there seem to be so many Mm -hmm. It's sometimes hard to know in amongst this sort of morass of AI tools, hundreds out there. Uh, would there be maybe, you know, the three or four that you would say these are the top ones that I've found most useful? Or uh, is it categories that you say, well, for this, this would be this? How do you go about advising on adding um, tools? It's, yeah, this is a, this is a great it's question. A big, big category, isn't it? It's, it's, and they're growing all the time. Yeah, and and if you're if you're into this, it's kind of fun because what's I'll try this. What's this person doing? The the incredible thing um, about that AI has done is that it's kind of democratized a lot of uh, coding, not necessarily graphic design or visual design or UX, but definitely coding. So the ability of people to create their own products has suddenly rocketed up. Um, so it it kind of lends itself more to the question of well, what's the problem I'm solving here? So I'll, I'll point out a couple of um, of the kind of the, the the big frontier models that I use that that might be helpful if people haven't gotten outside ChatGPT. ChatGPT is still um, like top of the heap um, for the broadest of tasks. If you were going to spend whatever it is, twenty pounds a month on one, it would be ChatGPT. Um, I use Perplexity now as my only search engine, and I would recommend everyone try that out for free. Perplexity is interesting because it's. It's an AI that's closer to being a search engine. So it won't lie to you when it says, here's a podcast or here's five podcasts about X, Y, Z. And it'll give you, it always cites its sources and you can click on them and check them out. It's, and it's always spot on. Um, if you, if you pay for perplexity, you get this additional um, layer of functionality where you can get it to search um, specific domains. So you can say, search the web for this day, for this question that I'm asking. You can say, search academic journals. You can say, you know, uh, do a data analysis, you know, do a breakdown of of this, like give me back pie charts and graphs and, you know, tables and that kind of thing. Um, so you, you can get much more nuanced searching with perplexity. Um, then another one that, that I use uh, quite a bit, and I haven't paid for it, but I, I use it anyway, uh, is Claude. And that's just great at digesting and working through large amounts of text. Um, so like you could put an entire book in there and start asking you questions. Um, so that, that that would be another one that I would use. In terms of tools outside of that, Fathom is a good, um, I think it's fathom.ai. That's another, it's just a note taker. Um, and soon, like Zoom, I'll, you're probably on this screen already, there's a little AI companion button down here. Um, and that's like Zoom are building that in, obviously. Um, I use a, uh, I use a, another little tool that I know the I know the guy who built it. So I, I bought it very early on to support him. It's called Audio Pen. And that's basically for speaking into, you know, you can, and it'll transcribe and you can do all kinds of interesting things with the, with, with the information uh, out of that. That's another one I re recommend. And, um, oh, Gamma is very, very good. So Gamma is... If you use pitch.com for creating presentations, Gamma is like an AI version of pitch.com. You can go in and say, you know, I need five slides to present to my board about uh, last quarter's results. Uh, that's very vague, <laughs> but it will go, it'll generate five slides with a theme and look and feel, and then you can tweak and adjust from there. And that's, again, that drudge work of where do I even start? You know, it just zaps that away. You're gone. Then, then your work can begin of like, okay, what's good, what's bad, what do I need to add? So that's just a couple. I could go on all day. Actually, the last thing I'll say, um, Andreessen Horowitz, the the US venture capital firm, they they put out a report last month of just kind of the the most funded AI um, products in different categories. And that's well worth looking at. I think I think there was 20, but they're, they're the kind of state of the art at the moment. So you can't really go wrong looking into any of those. That's really helpful, Connor. So I'll just read those back now for any of you so you can all come off this call and start uh, diving away, exploring. So Connor said uh, perplexity as a search tool. 
uh, Claude, and that's for uploading information, and then it can work on the uh, data there to ask your questions. Fathom for note taking, uh, Audio Pen, converting your audio into text, um, Gamma, which is like that's for pitch for pitch slides, and then the Andreessen Horowitz report. So that's really everyone can come off the call now and start exploring like mad. And um, I suppose then I'd just like to wrap up. You mentioned, as you say, that AI is incorporated in many of the platforms that we use now. As you said, it's incorporated into Zoom. So that's another thing that people can do is, you know, it's a standard platform they use. There's so much more to it now. Um, I noticed in um, LinkedIn, it offers an AI assistant for when you're writing. And also then if you are somebody who likes to write articles in LinkedIn, their artwork now is linked up too. So you, know, you don't have to bother about going to Canva to create your piece of artwork to go over, which is, so that's really helpful. So, I mean, that's something that I would often say to people is a, a website, you, you think you might, you th might think you know the site, but yeah. everyone else is trying to do it on your behalf. You know, everyone's making it easier for us, aren't they, Connor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're any platform of significance, you have to have an AI tool built in now. Just look for the little, it's always a little magic wand with the sparkles. It's there somewhere. And if you click it, you'll just get, you'll get something great. Yeah. And of course, that's it, isn't it? It is just dive in. I speak to so many people who say, oh, I saw it there, but I didn't like to. And I'm like, no, you just have to like, but it's not what, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, I know. It's, like, oh. it's, it's bringing in this curiosity. It's you're not going to learn if you're not curious to explore what it can offer you. So often there's a lot sitting in front of you that's just being ignored. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, uh, Jen has just asked, would we be able to share a link to the report that we mentioned? So that was the Andreessen Horowitz report. I don't have a link myself. Um, I don't have one now, but um, is there somewhere I can post it afterwards? Or we can, we can post afterwards with a link to everybody. I'll send a follow on to that. If you just then just Google Andreessen, it's double E, Andreessen Horowitz report. I'm sure it will pop up. I think it was last month. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it was last month, August. So, uh, yeah, just to wrap up then now, Connor, maybe um, you could just give, you know, what are your top tips? I'm, if I was to come to you yeah, in your AI consultancy role and just say, look, I haven't got a breeze what any of this is about, you know, what's what what are the top three things I can do today to go away to get a feel for for without feeling sort of lost or intimidated? Yeah. Um... It sounds it sounds kind of trite, but but jump in and, and start using them. Just um, there's a there's a very uh, there's a great book that I can recommend as well called Co-Intelligence by okay. Ethan Mollick. Um, he's a, a researcher at um, uh, Horton School of Business, and he's he's a very his newsletter is brilliant. His book Co-Intelligence is absolutely worth the read because it's not deep tech but you get a great sense of what these LLMs can do and also he has these kind of uh, not rules but he has these uh, four um, ideas about how to integrate AI into your work so I'd actually borrow the first one his, his first one is always invite AI to the table so the next thing you're Ethan doing Mollick, is it? Ethan Mollick M-O-L-L-I-C-K um, uh, always invite AI to the table so that meaning Whatever you're about to do next, just just kind of go, what what would happen if I opened ChatGPT and maybe created an account and just said, you know, I need to write an email to everyone on the team telling them X, Y, Z, um, you know, because this happened and, you know, da, 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 and just try that uh, and see what happens. And if it's your first time doing it, there is there is a kind of sense of magic. And then again, to go back to Ethan Mollick, he says you have to spend probably 10 hours with AI to fully appreciate where the boundaries are, what it's good at, what it isn't good at, where you need to put in extra work. Mm -hmm. So that investment, talk about leverage, that investment of, let's say, 10 hours mm -hmm. will pay off in spades for every AI tool you use. Because when it comes down to it, and you mentioned it earlier, like the, the construction of a good prompt is a skill that we're all going to have to learn. Uh, and it's not difficult. But the way you do that is by practice. So jump in, try stuff out. Don't be afraid. Uh, 
And yeah. And just remember, it's trying to be helpful. So <laughs> it will lie to you unless you unless yes, you we really will endorse that. I think it's possibly a little bit like sort of the early days, you know, of personal computers where you have to say to people, Well, look, just buy one, sign in, get the stuff done and start tapping away and don't be frightened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, now we have an upcoming uh course at 42 courses, uh AI for marketers and uh, Connor is part of that course um, mm-hmm. so uh, pre-registration for that course we'll share also after this and um, we'll get something out to everybody who registered on this call with all of the information that Connor's given us in this Q&A today but I just want to thank everybody for joining the call and uh, thank Connor for joining us today and sharing all of his super knowledge. As I say, it's it's an exciting time. It's early days still very much. We are all still learning ourselves, even people who have spent a lot of time trying to embrace it from the start. And it must be a very exciting time, I suppose, for yourself, Connor. You're, you are an air consultant dealing with customers, but at the same time, you're learning all the time, uh, you know, as, as it goes along. So it's great to have made contact with somebody like yourself if everyone follows Connor on LinkedIn I'm sure he's very generous about sharing uh, things he's learning himself so that's uh, great so thank you so much Connor Thank you. And thank you so much to everyone who showed up. I know I know there's probably the span of people who've never used before, and never logged in through to, well, I kind of know some of this already. But yeah, just keep keep plugging away. It's the it's the wave of the future, as they say. And thank you again for having me, Louise, and for your courses. It's my pleasure. And it's been lovely chatting with you today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, have a great rest of the day. See you. See you again for another one of our Q&As. Thanks very much for joining. We hope you enjoyed listening to this 42 Courses podcast. If you did, please like and share. Uh, Any comments are also very, very welcome. And of course, if you want to learn more about us, visit our website at 42courses.com. Thanks again.